One thing about that we know about God is that his forgiveness always follows faith and repentance. The very first message of Jesus as he began his ministry was, the kingdom is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Faith and repentance lead always to the forgiveness of God. We can nail that down because that's absolutely and always true. And so today, as we look at the third chapter of Jonah, you didn't know we could get this many sermons out of Jonah, did you? This is the eighth of 10, and I have been reading uh, sermons that I found on the internet and sermons I've looked up in my library. And there's some of these guys that preach 15 or 20 sermons out of Jonah, but we're only going to do 10, and then we're going to move on to uh, thinking about uh, Advent and Christmas and uh, that holiday season. But right now, we want to uh, look at Jonah chapter 3. We're going to look at the whole chapter, and it uh, outlines itself very easily, and one of the the best outlines that I've seen uh, in all of my uh, uh, studies and looking around is God's grace and compassion causes, number one, Jonah to respond obediently, and number two, the Ninevites to repent dramatically, and number three, for God to relent mercifully. Now, we need to get two words straightened out in our mind, and those words are revival and crusade. Notice that the, the title that I applied to this sermon today was a whale of a crusade. Now, what's the difference between a revival and a crusade? Well, first of all, uh, a revival is whenever Christians, whenever believers repent and renew their walk with the Lord. It's what Paul wanted to happen in the Galatian church whenever they kind of went astray theologically. It's what Jesus wanted for the churches in Ephesus and Pergamum if you read about the seven, cha uh, seven churches in the book of Revelation. That's what a revival is. And remember, uh, in last century, perhaps uh, when you were much younger, that uh, your church participated in revival meetings. Now, those were basically for church members, but they were also to, to get people from the community to come in and get saved. But a revival uh, by the dictionary is for believers to repent and change their ways, and become more and more conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a crusade, on the other hand, is when non-believers first trust in God's great and gracious love and repent of their sins. And so uh, Jonah at Nineveh, chapter 3, is one of these most excellent Crusades. In fact, you could say it was probably the first crusade in the Bible. Lots of people were saved. The entire city of Nineveh repented of their sins and God forgave them. Another great time of a crusade, uh, uh, as the definition goes, was at Pentecost. Whenever the, the disciples and others had gathered in an upper room and they had prayed and the Holy Spirit descended and indwelt everybody, and Peter got up before a huge crowd and began to preach the gospel so that people could repent, they could believe in Christ and repent of their sins, and in other words, become believers. Later in church history, a few years later, 20, 30, 40 years, these people who had initially been lost to God, who came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, and believed in Him and repented of their sins, 
they started calling these people little Christers, Christians that we call ourselves today. And so uh, a crusade was really not for Christians. A crusade was for non-believers to become believers. Jonah at Nineveh, Peter at Pentecost, and then we know that Billy Graham, uh, multiple, multiple crusades through the, the ages. And so uh, we're going to talk about a crusade today, the crusade that Jonah initiated. And so as we read in our, our scripture passage, it says in verse number one of chapter three, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk and cried out and said, yet 40 days Nineveh will be overthrown. And so uh, this is the beginning of Jonah's great crusade in Nineveh. Whenever I started preparing for uh, this uh, sermon, I uh, had a rather lengthy title. And so here, here's that title. I didn't put it on there because it wasted too much ink. But uh, uh, my first title was, God gives Jonah a mulligan, and Jonah initiates a whale of a crusade. What's a mulligan? You know what a mulligan is? Who's a golfer? It's a do-over, isn't it? It's whenever somebody graciously says, oh, that was a terrible, terrible uh, mess up you had there. You get to do it over. That's a mulligan. And, you know, that's what happened to Jonah. God came to Jonah in chapter one of Jonah and said, I want you to go to Nineveh and uh, tell those people to repent. And Jonah says, okay, I won't. And so he got on a boat and went to Tarshish in the opposite direction and uh, tried to get away from God. We know that, don't we? We know that Jonah disobeyed God in the first chapter. And at the end of the first chapter, because uh, God had caused a great storm, uh, the sailors in the boat that were about to die threw Jonah overboard, and a great fish swallowed Jonah, and he was in the belly of the fish three days, and on the third day, the fish, literally it says in the Hebrew, that the fish vomited Jonah up onto the seashore. And so uh, uh, as we begin that third chapter, we see that God says, okay, Jonah, I'm giving you a mulligan. You can go to Nineveh, and you've got to do over here. So uh, that's that's what this is all about. I, I heard uh, about a, a professor preaching that said, you know, whenever you, you're preaching a, a revival or a crusade or, or any time, actually, start out low, you rise higher, you strike fire, and then you retire. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, uh, one of the the guys that I worked for early in my career at the Nevada Baptist Convention was Ernie Myers, and uh, he had picked this statement up from his father-in-law. He said, there's no such thing as a bad, a, a bad short sermon. So uh, uh, basically, uh, Jonah's sermon was short, wasn't it? Literally all he said, in three days you're going to die. And I think he did a little dance when he said that. But anyway, uh, Jonah was not the first servant of the Lord, but God gave another chance to do what God originally called him to do. And he won't be the last. Listen to what Isaiah says, and Matthew repeated it about Jesus in the 12th chapter of Matthew. But over in the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, this is what Isaiah says about the Messiah. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. 
God is not in the habit of discarding those who fail him. He's in the habit of giving them a mulligan, another do-over. And so he does in our lives as well. But this, this Isaiah passage is really interesting. Uh, let me kind of walk you through it. You know, a reed is, is that little piece of wood, weed, whatever you want to call it, that they stick into a wind instrument and it vibrates and that's what causes the sound. And then of course the horn amplifies it. But if a reed really just goes totally limp, it's not any good anymore. And the musician takes it out and throws it away. Now a wick that is a little bit damp, whenever you, you put it into the lamp and light it, it sputters and smokes and doesn't give out any light. It stinks and sputters and smokes. It, it hurts your eyes. And so the, the basic thing is you take that old wick out, you throw it away, you get a brand new dry one and stick it in there and get it all wet with the oil and then it burns brightly. But what it says here is Jesus is not going to take any of us that are like this limp reed or like this smoking reed. He's not going to let any of those go to waste. He's going to rejuvenate, revive, and reuse these limp reeds and smoking wicks. That's what we are. And isn't it wonderful that he renews us with new strength to go on and do what God wants him to do. And that's exactly what happened to Jonah. And Jonah went and proclaimed the word of the Lord to the Ninevites. And so the first thing that we, we see is that always, whenever we have any kind of a crusade, go on any time when God works in a marvelous way, that God's message about judgment comes from his messenger. This messenger becomes a very critical part of bringing about God's renewal of hope in a lost world. So the second thing I want you to see in this passage of scripture is realize God hates sin and punishes unrepentant sinners. Now we say, oh, this is awful. We don't want to talk about this. But you know, this is part of the good news of the gospel. God really doesn't like sin. He hates sin, as a matter of fact. And indeed, he punishes those who remain in their sin. And, and so literally, that's what Jonah was doing. He said, he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He's saying that you people are sinners and you're going to be punished for it. And that's exactly what takes place. Now, listen to what uh, the psalmist says in chapter 5 of the Psalms, beginning with verse number 4. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells in you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. And so all the way back in the Old Testament, we see that God hates sin and eventually will punish those who remain in their sin. In the New Testament, Paul says it very simply. In Romans chapter uh, 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he also says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. However, the gift of God, not the wages, not what you earn, but what you're given freely, the free gift of God is eternal life is forgiveness forever. That's what 
this is all about. So realize God hates sin and eventually will punish those who remain unrepentant in their sin. Now, the third thing I want you to see in this passage is in verse number five, recognize and admit that you are a sinner. It says there in the first part of verse five, then the people of Nineveh believed in God. Now, I think this is important. It says the people of Nineveh believed in God. I think there's a whole difference in believing God and believing in God. Believing God, we probably could all agree God hates sin and will punish sinners. That's pretty theoretical. That's pretty theological. That's pretty scriptural. But to believe in God means that you put your trust in God that when you repent, he will forgive you. That's being in God. That's what it means to be in Christ, is Christ comes and lives within you. And that is extremely important. Recognize you are a sinner and that there is no way that you can save yourself. There is no way that you can escape judgment unless you are in God, in Christ. Listen to what the psalmist said. We just read about it in uh, Psalm 31 or 51. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. So here we are. We have this wonderful thing that when we admit that we are sinners and trust in Him, He saves us. Now, there are some people in this world that all they think about is how sinful you are. Do you, you know that? There's a church in Kansas, and unfortunately, it's a Baptist church. In Topeka, Kansas, the Westboro Baptist Church, and their main thought is this. God's hatred is one of his holy attributes. Well, they needed to qualify. They needed to qualify and say, God's hatred of sin is his holy attribute. But they leave that part of it out. They take exception to talk about the love of God and are virulently homophobic, anti-Semitic hate group. They believe America is a doomed country. They base their assumptions on the conviction uh, that their understanding and interpretation of the Bible is the only legitimate one. They regularly picket and stage protests around the country and have been holding signs that state, God hates Israel. Thank God for 9-11. God is angry at everybody. God hates fags. Thank God for dead soldiers. This is an absolute aberration of God's hatred. God hates sin, but I want to tell you something. He loves sinners. He loves sinners, and he's ready to forgive. But this, this whole thing of hatred becomes a stumbling block for us to see the world come to know Christ as Savior. The ancient military history website lists the five most evil empires that the world has ever seen. I don't know if I completely agree with them. I think they could have added uh, at least 10 others to this list. But they say the most evil empire that ever was, was the Third Reich from 1933 to 1945. The second most evil empire was the Assyrian Empire from 9-11 to 605 BC, right in the middle of the time 
of Jonah, right? He was right in the middle of this time of this most hated empire. Jonah hated the Assyrians. God hated the Assyrian sin. God was willing to save those Assyrians who repented of their sin. Jonah was upset about that. He didn't want that to take place. He wanted to see God zap all of these people. He was waiting for the third day. He wanted to see them all destroyed. But that didn't really happen, did it? But these Assyrians, they were awful people. You could go in back in the history books and, and look, but Ashurbanipal, the, uh, the, the second, a uh, hundred years before Jonah was written, he talked about uh, what he did. He said, I destroyed, I demolished, I burned, I took their prisoners, uh, their warriors prisoner, and paled them on stakes before their cities. He was described as uh, taking live prisoners, cutting off their hands, their nose, ears, fingers, burning them alive, gouging out their eyes, and even skinning them alive. All this and more was done so that he could intimidate the people who he was waging war against. Now, did Jonah have reason to hate the, the Ninevites, the Assyrians? Yes, he did. But that's not what God wanted Jonah to do. God wanted Jonah, even as he didn't like what the Assyrians were doing, he wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach so that these people could repent. And that's the way God works in our lives as well. So let's look at this repent to God of your sin. The last part of verse 5 and on reads like this. They called a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe with him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued proclamation and said in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast are to be covered with sackcloth. Let the men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. This whole city repented. They turned around. There is a town in Canada by the name of Wabush, not Wabash, Wabush. It's out in the middle of nowhere in Labrador. And in this town, there's only one way in to the town. There is no way out. You have to go out the way you came in. So in other words, you drive into this town, and the only way that you can get out is to turn around and go back the way you came. In Florida, there are 27 towns just like that. There is only one road in. It's the same road to leave to go out. That's what repentance really is. What you have to do is turn around on the road that you're traveling and go back the other way. That's what repentance is about. When you leave the love of God and go your own way, and when you realize you've gone too far and you turn around and go back to God, that's what repentance is all about. That's the grace and the love of God. You have to turn around. You have to go back. I heard this story about a guy that uh, he was in terrible pain because he was sitting on a tack. Just think about it. Sitting on a tack. And he wanted relief, so he called a, a psychiatrist. <laughs> and... The psychiatrist said, sir, the reason you're hurting is rooted in the traumas of your childhood. So what you have to do is go to therapy. That'll, that'll change everything. Well, 
that didn't work. So he called a sociologist and uh, the sociologist said, well, sir, here's the whole deal. Your problem is obviously a result of your environment when you grew up. It was, it, it was a hurt from your improper environment. And so you have to leave that environment. You have to go away from it. And so then he went to an economist and he said, uh, I'm really hurting on this tack, help me. And uh, so the economist said, well, money is the root of all hurt. What you need to do is establish uh, a good retirement plan and uh, have a, a, a economic portfolio that allows you to live above all of the hurts. And so he said that didn't work either. So he went to a minister and uh, he, he said to the minister, I'm sitting on this tack and it hurts. What do I do? And so the minister said, well, you really need to learn to praise God and read the scriptures. Because when you do that, uh, your spiritual life will just, it'll get better and better every day. And even with the advice from all these helpful people, this guy was still hurting, sitting on the tack. And he kept, everybody who come by, he said, I really am hurting. This tack is really hurting me. And a little girl came by and looked at him and looked down and where's the tack? I'm sitting on it. And he said, nobody has helped me. Nobody has told me what to do. And she said, well, if you want to feel better, get up off the tack. I mean, brilliant, right? No, it's just plain old common sense. When you realize that you were so deeply buried in sin and troubles and problems, the only way out is to turn around and repent and turn to God. That's what it's all about. C.S. Lewis said that repentance is not something that God demands of you before he will take you back. It's simply a description of what going back is like. Going back, repenting, is just embracing Jesus and allowing him to take over. J. Edwin Orr, I, I read a lot about him when I was in college and seminary. He was a, a great uh, uh, religious historian, and he wrote a lot about uh, all of the great awakenings of uh, uh, the last century or two. And uh, he said that uh, during the, uh, the Great Welsh Revival, the Great Welsh Crusade, literally, in uh, the uh, uh, 19th century, that the Holy Spirit convicted so many people of their sin and their need to make restitution. Well, uh, on the uh, coast of Wales, uh, uh, it created a real problem. Uh, over the years, uh, workers in the shipyards had stolen tools every day. And whenever they were saved, and recognized they needed to make restitution, they started bringing these tools back. And they said that in three or four of these shipyards, there were great piles of tools, so much that they, what, they didn't even have room to work. And so finally, uh, the, one of the shipyards put up a sign, and uh, the sign said something like, uh, uh, if you've been led by God to return what you have stolen, Please know that the management forgives you and wishes you to keep what you've taken. There wasn't room for all of the return on repentance. That's what happens when God gets a hold of people. There is this phenomenal change that takes place in their lives. And so that brings us to the very last part, which is rejoice in the assurance of God's forgiveness. Chapter 3, verse 10. 
When God saw their deeds that they had turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. That's the way God works, isn't it? I mean, he promises pain and, and tribulation, despair, whenever we don't repent. But when we repent, our lives are forgiven, we're changed. Somewhere, uh, Billy Graham was, was once asked that, uh, what's the difference between other gods and the God of Christianity? Billy Graham said, ours is the only God who strive to have a personal relationship with each one of us. Our God is the only God who would listen to everything we told him. Our God is the only God who will let a son die just because he loved us so very much. There was an old legend about uh, a guy that uh, got lost. He was traveling and got lost out in the wilderness and he wandered into a bed of quicksand. Confucius saw the man's predicament and said, it's evident that men should stay out of places like this. Buddha observed the situation and said, let this man's be a plight, uh, be a lesson to the rest of the world. Mohammed came by and said to the sinking man, so sorry, it's God's will. Jesus finally appeared. Take my hand, brother, he said, and I will save you. Take my hand, brother, and I will save you. That's the whole difference. That's what forgiveness is really all about. It's not something you earn. It's something you're given. You're given because of the blood of Jesus Christ. In the great prayer revival that took place in our country in 1857, it went from uh, New York to Detroit to Buffalo to Washington, D.C., and it finally moved to Philadelphia in, in a way. And one of the leaders of that Philadelphia group uh, of prayers was a man named Dudley Ting. And uh, he uh, started out uh, a November prayer meeting uh, at the YMCA with 5,000 people in attendance. And uh, uh, these people came to pray and and Dudley stood up and shared uh, uh, a word from Exodus chapter 10, verse 11. Go ye and serve the Lord. Then he said, I'd rather give my right arm than to give you that word because it's such a powerful word. Well, he went to visit a friend on a farm that week. And unfortunately, he got his arm caught in a corn thresher and it severed an artery. And when they pulled him out, they realized that there was no hope that he was going to die. They laid him down and his friends gathered around him. And one friend said, uh, Dudley, what would you tell us as your last words before you go to glory? And he said, tell everyone to stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. And he went to be with the Lord. The next Sunday at his funeral, there was a friend that stood up to preach his funeral. George Duffield was his name. And he said, uh, I'll miss my friend. And so in this quiet reflection of this week, I wrote a poem about my friend. And here's that poem. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Yet that men... Now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise or danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. 
put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer, where duty calls over danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day, the noise of battle, the next, the victor song. To him that overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the king of glory shall reign eternally. Pray with me. Our Father, as we come to you, recognizing this wonderful, wonderful passage of scripture that tells us about this very first crusade and how thousands of men and women and boys and girls repented of their sin and were brought to the safety. We think of those at Pentecost the thousands of men and women and boys and girls who turned their lives over to Jesus Christ, how they turned away from their sin and embraced the Savior. And we thank you for those people as well. We thank you for evangelists. We thank you for uh, crusaders. We thank you for men that preach the gospel to great throngs of people and how those people came to know you as Savior. And Father, we pray that whatever we can do, whether it's to go, whether it's to pray, or whether it's to give, we pray that we will have a part in these great times of thousands of people coming to know the Lord as Savior. Guide us now to be a part of that great and wonderful crusade. You've given us a mulligan too, Lord. Help us to use it for your honor and your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, Jesus told his disciples before he left them, he said, I'm going to go away. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And whenever you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, you're going to do greater things than you ever saw me do here on this earth. Billy Graham Crusades were evangelistic campaigns conducted by Billy Graham between 1947 and 2005. Billy Graham conducted 417 crusades in 185 countries and territories on six continents. The first Billy Graham crusade led September 13th through 21st, 1947 in the Civic Auditorium of Grands Rapids, Michigan, attended by 6,000 people. He would rent a large venue as a stadium, a park, a street. On these sessions became larger. He arranged uh, for groups of up to 5,000 people to sing in a choir. He would preach the gospel, invite people to come forward to ask Jesus to be their Savior and pray together. The inquirers were often given a copy of the Gospel of John or a Bible study booklet. In Durban, South Africa, in 1973, a crowd of 100,000 people was the first large mixed-race event in apartheid South Africa. In Moscow, in 1992, one quarter of 155,000 people in Graham's audience went forward at his call. During his uh, crusades, he often frequently used an altar call song, Just As I Am. Musical artists would accompany Graham on his crusades to sing either hymns or reflect his songs, including Cliff Barrows, Cliff Richards, Sheila Walsh, George Beverly Shea, George Hamilton IV. Over 58 years, Billy Graham reached 210 million people face-to-face -face and by satellite feeds in over 185 countries. The largest evangelistic crusade took place in New York's Madison Square Garden in 1957, lasted 16 weeks. The largest audience in history of Graham ministry assembled in Yodio uh, Plaza in Seoul, Korea in 1973. 1.1 million people. We get to be a part of this because God gave Jonah 
a mulligan. May he give us one today. Amen. Thank you.